Our Bible reading tonight comes from Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 to 5. Isaiah 66, verse 1. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being, declares the Lord. This is the one I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. But whoever sacrifices a bull is like one who kills a man, and whoever offers a lamb like one who breaks a dog's neck. Whoever makes a grain offering is like one who presents pig's blood, and whoever burns memorial incense like one who worships an idol. They have chosen their own ways, and their souls delight in their abominations. So I also will choose harsh treatment for them, and will bring upon them what they dread. For when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, no one listened. They did evil in my sight, and chose what displeases me. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hate you and exclude you because of my name have said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy, yet they will be put to shame. May God add his blessing to this reading from his word. Well, it's a great privilege to open up God's Word again uh, this evening. Uh, for those of you who are here this morning, you'd see that we are back in uh, Isaiah chapter 66. And this morning we work through verses uh, 1 to 4. Uh, but tonight is a separate sermon. Uh, but as we work through verses uh, 1 to 4, I wanted to really come back this evening and zero in on the second half of verse 2. Uh, so tonight we won't be doing a usual exposition um, of an entire passage. I want to focus in on really half a verse tonight um, and dig at it and see uh, what God is showing us. So uh, before we do that, let's just pray again and ask for his blessing upon the preaching of his word and the receiving of it. Heavenly Father, again, we come before you and we thank you for our time now to open up your word. We thank you that it has been read we have heard you speaking and we pray that you'd be continually speaking tonight as we consider your word, as we seek to dig into it and explore what your word has to say on this subject of trembling at your word. Lord, we confess immediately that apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, everything attempted tonight will be in vain and we will leave unchanged and the evil one would gain the upper hand in our lives, and even in our church. We pray you'd come and meet with us now. We pray that you'd reveal yourself. We pray that you would show us what you'd have us to see in our own lives. And God, may you get great glory this evening. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Where I want us to uh, zero in tonight is the second half of verse 2. So if you've got the passage open... Look at the second half of verse 2 with me. Yahweh says, This is the one I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Now, why is this, why is this a timely passage for us to consider? The subject this evening of trembling at the word of the Lord. Well, if we're honest, do we hear of much trembling over God's word in Christianity today? When you, when you think about the subject, trembling over God's word on an individual level, have you, when was the last time you heard a Christian friend, uh, someone from church, a brother or sister say to you, I was reading the word this morning. I opened up God's word. 
And God so met with me. He so challenged me. He so confronted me that I was overwhelmed in his presence. I was laid out before him. And I knew I was in the presence of majesty. He was there with me. And he uncovered me. Or what about on a corporate level? When have you ever heard someone, maybe a friend from another church, maybe a friend from our church, brother or sister, say to you, when the pastor, when he preached today, the presence of God was so strong, the conviction was so deep, the Holy Spirit came and convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment. There was no sleeping, there was no slumbering in the pews. Everyone was attentive, there was no boredom. And that you could hear a pin drop. The presence of God was so strong. There was no joking afterwards. There was no mucking around. There was a kind of hush that came over the place because we knew we were in the presence of the Almighty and we just heard Him. Do you hear people talk about the gatherings of God like that? A great trembling at His word. It's rather kind of the opposite today even from what we hear and maybe even what we experience, if we are honest regarding this. And this idea of trembling at God's word, it's almost now seen as the negative. The idea of of people feeling like they're trembling before God, shaking before God, brought really low, that's kind of against the experience that we want to create in church today, isn't it? I mean, if we're going to bring people in and it's, going to, and it's going to be a place people want to come, trembling isn't kind of the experience that we're going for, is it? And yet, look what it says here in verse 2. God says, this is the one I esteem. Now, that, what God is saying there is, this is the one I look at. This is the one my eye is upon. This is the one that I have favor upon. Now, this is the surprise here because we know as Christians, yes, God desires, you have, in order to be a Christian, you have to be humble. And in order to be a Christian, the mark of a Christian is being contrite in spirit, to, to be broken over your sin before God. Yes, yes, they're marks. But trembling at his word, what is that? That's a kind of foreign concept. And then we assume, well, if I'm a Christian, never really trembled before God's word, but if I'm a Christian, then I must be one of those ones who tremble at his word. Maybe not so. Maybe not so, this neglected subject. He says, to this one I look. This is what is pleasing to God. Look what has become displeasing to God. And we had a look at it this morning briefly. Look at verse 3. What had become displeasing to God. But whoever sacrifices a bull is like one who kills a man. And whoever offers a lamb like one who breaks a dog's neck. Whoever makes a grain offering is like one who presents pig's blood. And whoever burns memorial incense is like one who worships an idol. All of these acts commanded by God of worship. Literally, if, if Isaiah was writing in the 21st century, he would say their Lord's Supper is an abomination. When they put people under the water in baptism, it's an abomination. When they have fellowship after the service, I hate it. And when the preaching of the word happens, I have to block my ears and don't even get me started with the singing. I can't handle it. That's what he would say if this was written today. All of the things that he commands, God can't, can't stand. What he says here, and why is that? Well, the theme of the passage is the people trembling at God's word. Look, at, look jump down to verse 5. Again, the emphasis, verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. This is the great theme of the passage, trembling at God's word. What does God desire? Humility, contrition, And trembling at his word. Now, first point this morning that I want us to consider. Why does God desire trembling at his word? Why should we tremble at his word? There are a number of reasons. Let's consider a few. Trembling is necessary because of the greatness and the holiness of him who speaks. The greatness and holiness of him who speaks. Look at verses 1 and 2. This is what Yahweh says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being, declares the Lord. Because of the greatness and the holiness of him who speaks. Temples are not worthy of the Lord. 
the greatest buildings are not worthy of this God, even the old temple covered in gold. And think about it. Think about the, the fretting and the worry that goes on in the heart of a host when they know they've got guests coming over for dinner. Think about the fretting. What goes on in the mind? They're coming over soon. What are they going to say about the food? What are they going to say about the meal? What, what, what are they going to say about the house and, and, and the way that it's in order? What are they going to think? Or think about the fretting and anxiety that goes on in the hearts of a bride or a groom or the bridal party just before a wedding. What are people going to think of the dresses? What are they going to say? What are they going to say about the venue and the food? All of this worry about what people will say. What about what God has said? What about when God speaks? Does that matter to us? Is there any kind of thought, what has God said? And what does God think? His throne is heaven. The earth is his footstool. The universe cannot contain him. And he's chosen to speak to you and I about what's on his mind. When God spoke to Habakkuk in chapter 3, Habakkuk said this, When I heard, my heart pounded and my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. What about when God spoke to Daniel, that holy man? We don't read of any sin in Daniel's life. What, what, did, what happened? Daniel says this after the Lord spoke to him. Chapter 10, verse 8. No strength remained in me. My face grew deadly pale, and I was powerless. The word of God came to him, undone, completely undone. Why else is trembling necessary? Because God has spoken of a coming judgment. He has spoken of a coming judgment. God's word is full of threats of judgment. You cannot get away from it. And there are no empty threats. They're not empty warnings. There's no bluffs. One thing that you quickly learn, and many of you are more experienced than I in this room, you, you learn in, in parenting, when children start to disobey readily, more often than not, it is because the threats of punishment are not followed through. It's a bunch of hot air and noise. But when you don't follow through, they call the bluff. And they know that the punishment's not going to come. It's too costly. But the Christian, the Christian knows that God's threats of punishment, they are absolutely real. There's no bluffing with God. And he's proven himself that they're not empty. Sodom and Gomorrah was a foretaste of the coming judgment. He flooded the world in judgment. Even in the New Testament, he wasn't bluffing when he killed Ananias and Sapphira on the spot. His threats are very, very real. And there is cause for trembling at what's coming. And the Apostle Paul, he trembled at what was coming. In Romans chapter 9, you get a glimpse of Paul, the Apostle, weeping. He is crying like a baby. Why? Because the fellow Jews that he loves, they're not believing and receiving Christ. And he knows what's ahead for his fellow kinsmen. And what about the Lord Jesus Christ when he is in his Passion Week and he rides in on the donkey? And when he gets to Jerusalem, what, what happens? It says Jesus wept over Jerusalem. And Jesus is crying over the city. Why? Because he says, Oh, Jerusalem, you've missed your day of visitation and now you'll be left in desolation. And the temple would be destroyed. The Jews would be destroyed. And when they perished, they would cross over into their eternal prison. And he wept over them. You see, you cannot open God's word and read God's word of the coming judgment, the lake of fire. You cannot do it with a cup of hot chocolate in your hand. You cannot do it. It is a fearful thing. It ought to make believers and unbelievers tremble. Even the Christian. I was looking yesterday just at some basic statistics that everyone can find on the internet. Yesterday, the first day of the year, I looked in the afternoon and it said they approximated in the world already on January 1st, halfway through the first day of the year, there are already on average 76,000 deaths. Halfway through the first year, 76,000 deaths across the world. That's not got to do with COVID. That's average Every day, 153,000 people on average die. 
Every minute, 106 people. Every second, two people. Potentially every second, two people cross over into the lake of fire. Every second, two people cast into the lake of fire. It was Charles Spurgeon that said this, a great preacher, let me quote him. If a sermon concerning the future punishment of sin does not make the hearer tremble, it is clear that it is not from God. For hell is not a thing to talk about without trembling. My inmost desire is to feel more and more the overwhelming power of Jehovah's judgment against sin so that I may preach with all the deeper solemnity the danger of the unrepentant and with tears and trembling may plead with them to be reconciled. That's why we should tremble at God's word. Why else? Because God's word comes with absolute and complete authority. His word is completely authoritative. At the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, we're going through it in the mornings, we're on break at the moment. When you get to the end of that great sermon, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus wraps it up and what's the conclusion that happens? It says this in, at the end of the chapter, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority. When he spoke, he opened up everyone. Everyone. What's going on here? What's going on with this preaching? I'm not supposed to feel like this. The word of God is not like other books. It's not to help with life management. God's word is not full of tips and advice. It's not full of suggestions on how to live. It's not even merely a map for this world. It is the words of earth's lawgiver and judge. And he has spoken. He has spoken. And we must hear. His word contains precious, precious promises. But it also contains fearful warnings. God speaks with absolute authority over us. So what he says goes. And what he says will come to pass. And it must be heeded. Why else is his word to be trembled before? Because his word is often painful. This morning when we looked, we considered that God's word is like a two-edged sword. That's how he describes it. And it's two-edged because God sees everything in our lives. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21 says this, For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and the Lord examines all his paths. Everything you do, when you get up, the Lord is watching you. When you leave, he's watching you. When you're sleeping, he's watching you. What you're thinking, he knows. What you say in quiet, he hears. He sees all of it. And that's why Jeremiah 23, 29, the Lord says this, Is not my word like fire? Is not my word like fire, says the Lord? Is it not like a mighty hammer that smashes rocks into pieces? And the context of that is God is sick and tired of false prophets coming up and saying, peace, 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 everything's okay. It's all fine. And God says, is that what my word is like? God says, my word is a fire. It is a hammer. And not just any kind of hammer. The kind of hammer that can smash rocks to pieces. That's not the ordinary tool in the shed. It is a fire. Why? Because it consumes all evil it consumes and it destroys. It burns off everything that displeases God. But what does fire also do? Fire also purifies that which is good, that which is imperishable. It refines, it beautifies. And his word is like a hammer. It smashes. It breaks down pride. It breaks down arrogance. It breaks down defiance against God. And those who are God's greatest opponents become putty in his hands. The greatest threat in the world was Nebuchadnezzar, and God brought him as low as a wild animal. God's word can do that. It is like a hammer. This is what God does. Why else should we tremble before his word? Because of its exceeding worth. Because of its exceeding worth. When I was younger and... Whenever I used to hear the news on the TV or a report come out that someone won the lottery and they would say what area they won the lottery and they got their lotto ticket, the thing that would always come into my mind was 
how nervous that person must be to guard that ticket. When they see the winning numbers, they've got to get to wherever it is that they redeem the ticket because there are millions of dollars on that ticket. There's a lot of pressure guarding something like that. And that's what used to run through my mind. The ticket was valuable. But it's amazing how quickly money comes and goes, right? How fleeting it is. You know, you can save up so long. Save, save, save. And in a moment, it can all be gone towards a house. You can save up for so long and you can blow it all in one holiday. Money is just so fleeting. But God, he has given us something so much more valuable than fleeting money. And Peter recognized it. Peter recognized it. In John chapter 6, many people who professed to be Christians, they walked away from Jesus. Jesus lost 99% of his followers in one hit, in one sermon. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, well, you guys are going to leave too. You're going as well. What does Peter say? He understands he's received something that money can't buy. And he says, Lord, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Your word has eternal value. It's the gospel. It's salvation. No lottery ticket can buy that. And so we tremble because each one of us holds in the pocket of our heart something of infinite value. It is the gift of God, the word of the gospel. And every Christian in this room is a possessor of that ticket. He's given it eternal life. Well, we've seen, I think, sufficiently why we ought to tremble at God's word. Now I want us to consider two other portraits. The first portrait is of those who do not tremble at God's word. And may God, by his spirit and his word, reveal if this be you. Those who do not tremble at God's word. There are a number of things to see in this portrait. Firstly, they are careless, they are carefree, and they are fearless towards God. Carefree and fearless towards God. They do not fear that God is holy. They do not fear his warnings in the scripture. And this was exactly the problem of Uzzah. You remember in the Old Testament, God had had them to make the Ark of the Covenant, that box that was complete gold, and it was to be the symbol of God's presence. And that box symbolizing God's presence was to stay in the back of the temple, in the holiest part of the temple, where no one else was allowed to go. It's where God's presence was. And they were to take it out when they went to battle. But Israel sinned against God, and the Ark was captured. But fast forward. The ark is regained from the Israelites. And David says, bring it back home. But God gave specific warnings about the arks. There were hoops on the ark for a reason. You were not to touch it. And you put hoops on the bottom of the ark so you can put poles through it. So that's why when you transport this cart, when you transport the ark, you do not touch it. You hold the poles. No one is to touch it. Well, the great celebration happens. The ark is coming back to Israel. David is celebrating. Israel is celebrating. The ark is on the back of an oxen cart. And as the oxen is walking, one of the oxen trips over and stumbles. And the ark starts falling off the cart. It's about to hit the ground. And Uzzah reaches out his hands to stop the ark from, from falling on the ground. And God strikes him dead in that moment. And his body has to be carried away. Uzzah did not fear God as holy. And he did not fear the warnings of God. He did not heed the instruction. How much trembling have we seen in the last two years regarding the pandemic that we've faced? How much trembling in the hearts of men, Christian and non-Christians, every time new information would come out, a trembling. How much trembling is there when, when we are potentially going to receive a diagnosis that is shocking, a medical diagnosis. How much trembling comes over us? Or what about the thought of a potential terrorist attack in our land? What about the trembling? We tremble when we hear a noise outside our house at night. We tremble for all these things, and yet we do not tremble at the words of the living God. We feel nothing. We are not moved, no shuddering, no trembling, no quaking. Man doesn't. Tremble at God's word. Even creation trembles at God's word. Back in chapter 64 of Isaiah, it says this, verse 3, You came down and the mountains trembled. 
Even the mountains trembled. When Jesus spoke during his ministry, even the demons fell before him and trembled. The demons were trembling before him at his word. And yet man senses no need for trembling, does not fear the words of God, just carefree, completely fearless. And how else does this manifest? No preparation for worship in the house of God. People can come and go, walking into God's presence as if it's the smallest thing. You remember in Exodus 19.10, when God said, Israel, you've just come out of Egypt. You're going to meet with me at Mount Sinai, but you need to prepare yourselves. And God gave them three days to prepare. Three days. Get ready. I'm coming. Get ready. You're going to meet with me. And yet we come on a Sunday, and how many don't prepare, don't tremble, fearless and carefree? What else do they look like, those who don't tremble? They are presumptuous and have misplaced confidence. Presumptuous and misplaced confidence. The Word of God never challenges them because they always presume the best about themselves. Let me give you a couple of examples. When the parable of the sower is preached or read, they immediately plant themselves in the good soil. That's who they are. And they completely miss the crescendo of that parable. What does Jesus say at the end of it in, Luke, in, in Luke's gospel? He says, be careful then how you listen. Because it might be you. You might be one of the first two, the first three. But they don't do that. They're always the good soil. Never a worry. Or what about the parable of the ten virgins? They immediately, as soon as they hear that parable, they immediately identify with the five wise virgins. That's me. That's me. Very, very presumptuous. Now, please don't get me wrong. Assurance before God, assurance of our salvation, that is a precious thing that we should rejoice in. But presumption is a curse and is a snare. Such people, what do they do? They flick off all the warnings from Scripture and they take every single promise and apply it to themselves. The warnings do not come. Say, for example, 2, Corinth, uh, 2 Timothy 4.8, it says this, There is in store the crown of righteousness to all who have longed for his appearing. Who gets the crown? All those who were eagerly longing for Jesus to come back. And you can have a bunch of people who call themselves Christians. They do not give a second thought about the second, a second coming. They do not long for Jesus to come back, but they apply that Jesus is coming back for me. Presumption. They do not tremble at the word of the Lord. What else are they like? They have a low view of God's word. How does this manifest, this low view of God's word? They are the ones who put God's word under scrutiny when it's God's word that should be putting them under scrutiny. They stand and judge the word instead of the word judging them. Think about it. There's issues that come up in the Bible and they're controversial or they, they hit us wrongly and, and we get agitated by them. So what do we do? What do these people do? Well, they test it against science. They test it against modern research. They de test it against what psychology and sociology has told us. And then you get sort of issues like creation. All of a sudden, creation is just poetry. Or the roles of headship and submission in marriage. That was just cultural because we know better now. Or the roles of men and women in the church. That was cultural, what the Bible says. Or instructions for parenting. You see, this enables people who have a low view to be free from the ultimate authority of God's word over them. It frees them up from the shackles. And what else they do? They pick and choose from God's word. They pick what they like. They only accept certain portions of God's word and they demand that only certain things are preached. Don't talk about that. Don't preach about that. Don't go there. They pick and choose from God's word because they cannot endure the whole counsel of God's word. What else are they like, those who don't tremble? They twist and manipulate God's word. They twist it and manipulate it. And unfortunately, the greatest culprits of, these, of this is pastors and preachers. Pastors and preachers. And they twist the scriptures. Why? For church growth. To keep people happy. To make people come in. It's because of a fear. And they twist it. What does it look like? Practically, what does it look like? It's often bluntening the sharp edges. 
just smoothening it out. It's often explaining things away, going a roundabout kind of way. It's often broadening the promises and narrowing the, the, the warnings and the threats. And then it's using other verses to kind of explain away what this verse really says because it's quite uncomfortable. Twisting and misusing God's word. And lastly, of those who don't tremble, what are they like? They are those who neglect God's word continually. Those who neglect God's word continually do not tremble before it. Now this one here is particularly a fearful group. Particularly fearful. Now they would never say... This kind of person, they would never say a bad word about the Bible. Never. Never. They would affirm it as inspired word of God, that it is God-breathed. They recognize the Bible as a source of truth. They can sign off on all of those statements about Scripture, and yet they are not so much as moved to pick it up and read it. They subscribe to all of it, but they do not even pick it up. They honor it with their lips and yet it stays closed at the very same time. It collects dust while the TV is overworked. They listen to it on Sundays, but it has no part in their lives. It's never applied. It's never outworked. It's never discussed. Such people as these certainly do not tremble at God's word. Those there, be assured of this, a Bible that is rarely, rarely opened is a sure sign of a person who doesn't tremble at God's word. Make no mistake about it. I think that should be sufficient, sufficient for seeing and considering the portrait of those who don't tremble at God's word. Now lastly, lastly tonight, let's consider the portrait of those who do tremble at God's word. What are they like, those who tremble? Well, there's a few things here. Those who tremble at God's word are those who are familiar with God's voice. They are familiar with it. They know the voice of God because it is the primary voice in their life. It is the primary voice that comes to them. The word of God is not some sacred ornament that stays in the fine china cabinet, not to be touched. That's not how the word of God works in their life. They are attentive to God's word like the young boy Samuel. When God called to him, he said, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Like Abraham, when God called him to get his attention, Abraham said, Here I am, Lord. And like Mary, when her sister Martha, she's so busy doing everything she can for Jesus, Mary is there, quiet, sitting at Jesus' feet, taking in every single word that falls from the Master's lips, taking it in, drinking it in, hearing the Master's voice, You see, this is the great paradox of Christianity. Trembling, in a normal sense, would make us want to flee from something. But trembling, in the biblical sense, makes us want to flee to. Flee to him. See, we recognize that Moses, like Moses and Isaiah and Habakkuk and all these men, that the Lord is a fearful God, but we also recognize that there is no safety outside of him. There is no place for refuge outside of him. And so instead of, when we tremble, instead of running from him, we run to him. We run to him because we recognize that he is a good God. We recognize that he is faithful. We recognize he is merciful. We recognize that his love is steadfast towards us. And we recognize that he receives us as sons. And so we flee to him. What is the trembling? What is this trembling that God desires that we're talking about here? It's not disbelieving that God will save you. I just don't know if he's going to save me. Or when I get to judgment day, I don't know if Jesus is going to rescue me. He's going to let me fall. I might not make it. That's not the trembling. It's not a fear that Jesus might not save you. It's not a fear that his love might be removed if you do a certain thing. That's not what it is. It's knowing who God really is. It's knowing more and more of his holiness and his greatness. And the deeper you go, the deeper you press into God, the more humble you become, the more broken you become. And it leads to more and more surrender because you're seeing more of God. See, the trembling... They don't come to God seeking for rewards. The trembling come to God like David for mercy and goodness to follow me all the days of my life. 
John Wesley, who did more for the Lord than all of us combined in this room will ever achieve. John Wesley, at the end of his life, on his deathbed, someone came up to him and said, are you ready to receive your reward? You know what John Wesley said back? I'm ready to receive mercy. He knew his Lord. Everything, even heaven on the final day, was the mercy and kindness of God. You see, do you see those who mourn over their sin because of our lack of Christ's likeness? It leads us to God to be comforted by the Holy Spirit. And those who mourn are those who get the precious ministry of the Holy Spirit in their lives. So the paradox is those who are mourning over their sin, those rejoice the most because the Holy Spirit is working in and through them and they sense the presence of God. Those who come broken and are brought low, it makes the reality that they are sons of God all the more sweeter. Those who tremble at the coming judgment, it makes them cling to the gospel with all of their might. You see, trembling is not this bad thing. It's this wonderful thing to bring us deeper into communion with the living God. It brings us to. It doesn't drive us away. This is the extraordinary paradox of it. The more we tremble, the more we're brought low before him, the more we experience of our God. The more we know him. Those who tremble at God's word are obvious because they respond to it and they obey his word. The one who trembles at God's word responds to it. And the greatest example I could think of here came to mind was Noah. Did Noah tremble at God's word? What does it say in Hebrews 11 verse 7? Extraordinary words. It says this, By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built the ark to save his family. Now, did you catch the order of that? He was a man of faith before God. Why? Because God's word came to him to build the ark. God spoke his word. And what happened? With holy fear, he responded and built the ark. Those who tremble at God's word in holy fear, they respond to God. They respond even if they're the only one, like Noah. It's said regularly, we hear it time and time again, you've heard it more than I have, that young people who grow up in church, they're taught the stories of of the Bible. They're taught about the characters of the Bible. They've heard the message from infancy up, and yet they get to uni And they're challenged by their professors and their teachers and they give it all away. They throw it away and they stop believing. Now what's happened there? Were they not taught enough about apologetics? Were they not taught and equipped enough to be able to argue with science? Did they not learn enough of that? What's going on here? Let me ask you, could the Bureau of Weather have convinced Noah to not build the ark? Absolutely not. If these young people are convinced to throw it all away, what's the problem? They never trembled at his word and they threw it away. They threw it away. They did not fear God and they were not gripped by his word. No one could have convinced Noah and no one can convince a Christian otherwise because they've met with God and they've heard his voice. They fear the Lord. That's what's happened no trembling. Those who tremble at God's word respond and obey. Those who tremble at God's word also do not speak and use God's word trivially. trivially. They do not use the word trivially. We saw earlier that those who don't tremble at God's word, they twist and they manipulate the scriptures for selfish gain and for selfish purposes. How did the great apostle Paul handle the word of God? How did he use it? That great teacher of souls. What did he do? He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. Why? Was Paul afraid of public speaking? No, he wasn't. He came with fear and trembling because he was handling the words of the living God. And he had a message of the Messiah crucified for sinners. And he came handling that precious word. And he spoke with much trembling and fear. Those who tremble at God's word do not speak of it and use it trivially. 
See, if you are one who trembles at wor- the word of God, when you lead a Bible study, you lead it with trembling. When you share the word and you evangelize, you do it with trembling. When the word of God is preached, it is done with trembling because you recognize when you hold and handle and speak the word of God and teach it, you are handling the very diamonds of God. Nothing less than that. See, this lack of trembling at God's word, why I brought up at the beginning, it is plaguing the modern church. It is plaguing the modern church and we are crippled of all of our power. We just are. I spoke to a Christian brother just this week and he's had to move churches and, he, and on the phone he was lamenting to me the fact that he's gone around visiting churches and he is so distressed at the lightness and the foolishness that's going on in all of the churches that he's visited. And he said, where can I go without give the word of God and people would treat it with reverential fear? Where can I go where I actually see people who actually think they're going to meet with God? And I will say, even just this very day, someone spoke to me. They've had to move away. They've had to move interstate. And they've been looking for churches. And they have lamented the same fact just today, they told me. And it is crippling the church of Jesus Christ Because we no longer tremble at the word of God. And it doesn't suit the experience that we're trying to give this world when they come in our doors. Let me begin to wrap up here. This is an important one. The people of God tremble because they don't want to displease God. They don't want to displease him. When we read the scriptures, the New Testament, don't, don't listen to people who say the New Testament isn't about commands and doing things. Read your New Testament. There are lots of commands for the Christian. They don't save you, but we have commands. Now, when we read your New Testament, they are holy commands. They are wonderful commands. And John says his commands, they're not, a bur- they're not burdensome to us. We delight in his commands. But as we read them, we we love them, but we struggle with them because of ongoing sin, ongoing temptation, the pressures of this world, the pressures of unbelievers, and the working of the evil one. And we struggle with it, but we find assurance. Why? Because all of the commands in Scripture, they've been fulfilled in Christ. He is our righteousness. He has obeyed God's law. He has died in our place, and now we're righteous in God's sight. And we find great assurance, and it's wonderful. And we praise God. So why do we still tremble? Because we don't want to displease our master. We don't want to displease him. Think about Joseph. Joseph is presented with this sexual encounter. A once in a lifetime. And it's before him. And it can be completely behind the scenes. And what does Joseph say to the adulteress? He says to her, how could I do such a great and wicked thing against God? How could I? I love him. I do not want to do a single thing that would displease him. Why do we tremble at God's word? Because we don't want to displease him. We want to obey him. We want, we want to see the smile of God. We want, to, we want to hear him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Not just because Christ is our righteousness, but because we live for him in this world. Don't you want that? That's why we tremble before him. And lastly, those who tremble, the word of God affects every sphere of their life. Every sphere of their life. What do we see about those who don't tremble? They give God's word just lip service. It's infallible. It's God-breathed. It's a source of truth, and that's where it stops. Those who tremble at God's word, the word affects every sphere of their life. How do the trembling live? It affects the church that they choose. It affects what they expect in a church. It affects the entertainment that they allow in their lives. It influences their home, their marriage, their parenting, their relationships. It affects the use of their money, 
It affects the use of their time. It affects all the decisions of their life. The Word of God, it does that. So let me ask, is this you? Is this you? You can hide from me. And you can conceal it from me. And it doesn't matter. I will weep for you. But it can be completely hidden. But God knows. God sees. And he has given us this word so that you would let go of that. And that he would expose us and show us who we really are. So are you one who trembles at the word of God? It has taken a hold of you. And you tremble before his word. Or are you of those who affirm everything about the word? Yes, 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 I subscribe. But it has no part in your life. It is a dust collector. And you live for yourself. Who are you? May the Spirit of God reveal that to each and every one of us. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. We trust that you have met with us. God, I pray you'd be at work in each of our hearts this evening. I pray that the evil one wouldn't snatch your word away so that it would prove unprofitable. Lord, I pray that we would see in Christ all that is needed for salvation and life and hope for the world to come. I pray, Lord God, you'd help us to be honest with ourselves. I pray as we considered your word is a hammer, your word is a fire. May you burn off what is displeasing to you. May you break down all pride, all resistance that comes against the challenge of your word. Break it down, smash it to pieces. And God, may you come and bring the great and wonderful promises that are found in the Lord Jesus Christ of all who come and repent and cast themselves upon the mercy of God. Lord, we look to you this evening as we had sung tonight. Our eyes upon you. So, Lord, may you glorify yourself in our lives and in this church, we pray. And may the church of Jesus Christ again, once again, recapture the power of the Holy Spirit, a people that trembles at your word. Lord, may you do this for your son's sake. Amen.